Welcome to my daddy's podcast. I hope you like it. Mew. It's a people-driven, relationship-fueled position to, to hold. It's a position of honor to actually hold this position as a strength and conditioning coach of a team, irrespective of what team and what sport. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by Coach Ashley Jones. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, man, my friend, it's been like five weeks since I've gotten to do one of these. So I will do my best to give you a recap of the month that was. I will try not to take too much of your hard-earned time, but, you know, just want to touch base with you, let you know what's going on in my neck of the woods. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, I hope you had a safe and healthy holiday season. I think this holiday season was different for a lot of reasons, you know, <laughs> mostly being a, a lot of us didn't get to spend time around any members of our extended family or a lot of cases just like our closest relatives. So, you know, we did the best that we could here, did like a little drive around one day and drop gifts off at uh, Jess's family's house. I got to see my parents. Uh, they came up from Florida for, you know, a couple of days and were working on our family farm. So I got to see them a couple times, but yeah, just kind of strange in the sense that you, know, you don't have traditional Thanksgiving. You don't have traditional Christmas. Even New Year's was super low key. We normally go to our neighbor's house and there's about 40 people running around between kids and adults. And I think total, there were about nine or 10 of us this year uh, at our gathering. And it was only people that we see on a very regular basis. So you know, it is what it is right now. Hopefully, you know, we get through the winter here in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, just kind of get through the next couple months and hopefully come spring, things will start to settle down a little bit. But, you know, all in all, Xmas was amazing. Kiddos had absolute blast, just a really good time those couple of days. And it was nice having it. I think it was on a Friday. Uh, it was just nice having kind of an extended weekend, two weekends in a row, because, if you know anything about myself, <laughs> tend to take a lot of time off. So it was really nice to just kind of chill out, relax, uh, spend some extra time with the family and uh, slow down a little bit. So Christmas was great. New Year's was good. As strange as it is not having school regularly, we're still in virtual learning. Um, hopefully that changes in the, the next couple weeks. But kiddos still have sports going on. So that's kind of fun. Uh, Kendall has been crushing indoor loving indoor soccer. So that's really fun. It's fun to watch that and just watch her enthusiasm for the game grow. You know, we got around New Year's and we don't talk about resolutions, but, you know, just random family table talk. Oh, you know, what, uh, what goals do you have for yourself this year? And one of hers was, I want to get better at soccer. So we kind of filled out like a little goal list and she, you know, said, well, I want to go to the gym, go to IFAS twice a week and practice uh, I want to watch a soccer game and she's obviously playing soccer right now. So we did it for the first time ever last week where we went in the gym twice. Uh, she played a game yesterday and man, like you could see a difference. And so I was really trying to praise her for that, praise her for her effort and her hard work. And hopefully that will transfer over going forward. And, you know, I think this is one of the things that all of us coaches realize is that the things that we do in the gym can make obviously a massive impact on somebody's physique, how they feel about themselves. But so many of the the life skills that we teach in the gym can be very easily transferred over to other areas of life. And that's why I think it's such a powerful tool that we have in our toolbox to teach people, you know, look, if you can be successful losing weight or building muscle or getting stronger or improving your athletic performance, like if you can do those things, man, what else can you accomplish with yourself? So that's the way I look at it. And that's the way I always try and uh, flesh it out or kind of explain it to people. But it's cool, you know, because she'll be 10 here in a couple of weeks. So hopefully these are skills that we can develop, you know, not only goal setting, but, you know, hard work, work ethic, that sort of thing. Hopefully these are things that she can transfer over to other areas of her life going forward. So she's crushing soccer. Cade is, <laughs> he's in basketball. Let's just kind of leave it at that right now. My guy needs some work, but you know, it's fun. I just like the fact that they have something to look forward to, something that gets them out and gets them active. Obviously we can do a lot of stuff. I mean, Cade and I, the other day, it was like maybe high thirties, but it was a beautiful sunny day. 
took Kay and the dog and went and hiked for like an hour. So we're going to find stuff to do, but it's nice that they have some sports and they have some things to look forward to outside of virtual learning and staring at Jess and I every day. So that's kind of the update on the fam. Got the annual program started. The uh, 2021 annual program is off and running. Got a really good group. Don't think I've ever had a bad group, if I'm being honest, but I got a really good group this time. Very focused. Lots of questions in a good way, like lots of curiosity in the group, which I like, a lot of enthusiasm. And then really the goal is two weeks in, can we maintain as much of that intensity and that curiosity over the next 50 weeks so that we make this their best year ever. But really excited about this group and excited to hopefully help them make 2021 their best year ever. Last but not least, one pretty big piece of news that I am excited to share with you here today. So when I created the Complete Coach certification years ago, I honestly didn't even bother chasing CEUs from a lot of the uh, big providers. Reason being, first off, a lot of them don't like when the term certification is used in the title. And so honestly, I just didn't think there was any way anybody was going to give me CEUs. But in the year and a half, two years since I launched the product, I got more and more people that asked, can I get CEUs for it or will you apply? So I figure, what the hell, I'm at least going to apply and see what happens. And sure enough, uh, out of the four or five groups that I applied to, one said, no, you use the title certification, so it's immediately out. They didn't even look at it. Uh, Another one looked at kind of the outline for the course and claimed it looked too basic. So (laughs) I had to chuckle a little bit because... Hey man, too basic. Come on. Squatting is basic. Deadlifting is basic. Program design is basic, but you got to understand the fundamentals. Like there's higher end stuff in there, but you got to understand the fundamentals first. So neither here nor there, they said no, but believe it or not, the one that I thought for sure would say no, the NSCA actually finally said yes. So I got not one, not one and a half, but 2.0. NSCA CEUs for the Complete Coach Certification. So very excited about that. So all the people that have gone through the course, taken the quiz, passed the quiz, they're not only going to get a shiny new diploma, which I had uh, my graphics and web design guy create for me, but here very shortly, they're also going to get a certificate in the mail for 2.0 NSCA CEUs. And if You've never reported for the NSCA before. That may not sound a lot. The NSCA actually does 0.1 CEUs per hour. So like one hour counts for 0.1. So that's like 20 continuing education hours. That is what you need for an entire year. So huge, huge win for Team Robertson over here. Very excited about that. and Very excited that now, you know, hopefully we're going to get the complete coach cert in front of that many more people because we'll be on the, the NSCA website. And I know as well, a lot of times people don't want to invest in a course or spend money on Con Ed if they're not going to get CEUs for it. So very, very excited about that. Um, if you have already passed the course, you probably already know this, um, but you're going to be getting some materials in the mail for me very, very shortly. And if it's something you've considered investing in before, you've considered taking the course in the, in the past, but haven't maybe taken that leap because CEUs were an issue. Now, hopefully it's a non-issue. So very excited about that. As you can tell a lot going on in my neck of the woods, it's been a long five weeks, but just very excited about kind of where we're at. Hopefully the kiddos get back to school. We can keep kind of pushing things forward, but just excited with where things are at, man. I think 2020 probably (laughs) wasn't ideal for any of us, but 2021, baby, It's a shiny new year, and I'm excited to see what we can do. So let's take a quick break, and then we're going to jump into this awesome new episode with my guy, Ashley Jones. It seems like almost every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if this sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get 
and know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is gonna take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. How to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results. The exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym, from squatting and deadlifting, to pressing and pulling, and everything in between. And last but not least, I've added an entire section on my assessment process and how to use that to write programs faster and more effectively than ever before. Of course, there's a ton more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the certification is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the certification will open twice per year for a limited time only. If you're interested in learning more, my next certification will launch in March 2021, and if you join my free insiders list, you'll be able to save $200 when it opens. To get on the insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, completecoachcertification.com, and then stay tuned for our launch emails coming very soon. Thanks so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Certification when it launches. Ashley Jones is a rugby strength and conditioning coach who is about to start his 30th preseason in professional sport. During this time, he has coached in three sports across seven countries and spanning four continents. In this show, Ashley and I talk about a ton of different coaching-related topics. We start by breaking down how he got started in rugby and how that journey has continued through 30-plus years of coaching. From there, we talk about how his programs have evolved, both from a philosophical and practical viewpoint. And last but not least, we talk about player interactions and take a deep dive into his quadrant system, which is a fantastic way to give your athletes more input into their program design. Even if you're not into rugby, there's a ton of great insights in this show, and I really think you're going to love it. But enough for me. Let's do this. Ashley, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to chat with you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Thanks very much, Mike. It's been a great honor to be here, actually, because I've, I've heard a lot about you and read a lot about you. And to get the invitation was a, a pretty good Christmas present, I must admit. <laughs> I really love the way that Lynn Jones, one of my first mentors, actually introduced himself. And I'm going to steal a little bit of his thunder <laughs> in that he introduced himself as Welsh by birth, Australian by choice, and American by accident. And uh, <laughs> Those people who don't know, Lynn was a weightlifting coach in the United States and Australia for many, many years and one of the nicest men in the industry, I believe. So I'm going to use Lynn's intro and basically say, well, I'm Irish, Scandinavian by ancestry, Australian by birth and New Zealand by marriage. So oh, wow. that's, as, that's as close as I'm going to get to Lynn's situation at this point in time. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. So talk to me a little bit about how you got started in all this. You mentioned Lynn, but what led you to the world of physical preparation initially? Well, I'd, I played rugby since I was eight years old. And I remember a guy coming up to me when I was at the under 15 state championships in Sydney. And I just won forward of that competition. And my, I was a little bit bigger than the average at that age group, so uh, I had a, a, like a, a physical advantage to begin with. But he said, if you if you keep training and and keep working hard, there's a fair chance uh, you might be a part of the Australian national team next year in under 17s. So that's all I needed as a as a carrot. And I uh, found a gym nearby, a place called American Health Spa in Brookvale in Sydney, Australia, where uh, I was born and raised run by a former Mr. Canada, Vince Basile. And that's where I got my initial introduction to weight training. And I was fortunate there was a couple of big power lifters there by uh, name of Pat. And he really took no nonsense from us. Uh, Young pups are in the gym. So (laughs) sort of give us a clip around the ears if we, our technique strayed away from what was good. And so the following year, I I continued work and, and used to run heaps as well to and from the gym and all that. And I was selected to captain Australian under-17 team. and But then injury took part, and I had quite a few issues with shoulders, so I thought the only way to be involved with the sport that I loved, rugby, was to basically go into some sort of training role. And, and back in those days, uh, the only entry port was a physical education degree. So I started uh, teacher training, and I realized very, very quickly that although teaching was my profession, that being a trainer was going to be the industry I worked in for the rest of my life. 
I love that. I love that. So talk to me about your career path. You know, you get this this physical education degree. You know you want to be a coach. What was that career path looking like for you, though? Because, again, I, I think a lot of the young coaches need to hear that you don't just get a degree and then jump into your dream job. Like, what were the steps that you had to go through to get to where you're at now? Well, I guess back in those days, it was quite quite murky, really, because there was no sort of clear pathway whatsoever. So you basically had to beat your own path, I think. And initially, I was working at a gym, which was close to the university where I was going to, as a Nautilus Fitness and Leisure Center. And Nautilus was huge in Australia in the late 70s, early 80s. And I had a really good grounding in working with people, different uh, people coming into the gym and things like that. And then when I went to uni, the the first week at uni, I went to the library to do some work and found a copy of the uh, NSCA journal and was reading, read it cover to cover within a, about an hour. And that basically was the, the catalyst, I think, for to switch my idea from being a teacher to being a coach. And it was all about writing as many letters back in those days as possible to to get that to get their first opportunity, I think. And uh, I I wrote copious letters to all the major rugby league clubs in Sydney initially because that was the most professional of all sports in Australia at that time. And it it came through that you really needed to be an ex-player or have some sort of identity to begin with to actually get a gig in that particular sport. So fortunately, one guy was really kind and passed my details on to other people around the, the league. And But my first break was in basketball. And mm. I went into, I sent a letter to the Sydney Kings organization and they played in the legendary Lakers colored, colors of purple and gold. I went in for a, an interview and they asked me to just to warm the team up as, as part of my interview process. And I was so fortunate that the owner, Mike Rabluski, had just come back from Los Angeles. And he said afterwards that he saw the Los Angeles Lakers trainer doing exactly the same movements and drills and uh, activities that I was using to warm the team up. And he told the organization to hire, hire him. So um, <laughs> that's how I got my break in the industry and uh, moved from there to rugby league and, and now into rugby union over the last, oh, 1992 was my break. So almost 30 years now. Wow. Wow. And for the uninitiated like myself, what's the difference between rugby league and rugby union? Well, it's it's just the number of people on the field, basically. Okay. Uh, rugby is a 15-man game. Rugby league is the 13-man game. Okay. Rugby league was the professional sport for many, many years, and, and rugby uh, finally became uh, professional in, in the late 90s. And it's obviously there's a lot of intricate rule differences in, in rugby union. We have, the, we have a line out where the ball's thrown into uh, play when the ball goes out of touch. We have different scrummaging laws, things like that. But they both le- – they, League came out of rugby, okay. As rugby came out of soccer, so there's a fair lineage going back to uh, to the game of soccer originally, and and obviously American football came out of uh, rugby. Yeah. So uh, they're all intrinsically linked, but they all have their subtle and often not so subtle differences. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's start with a really basic question here, and I like to ask this of basically every coach that comes on here. How would you describe your overarching philosophy as a coach? Well, I've all been I've always been about simplicity, so I'll keep this really straightforward and very simple. But I think would be every day better would be my mantra as far as a coaching philosophy. It's it's my it's my why, if you like to use a Simon Sinek approach to it, and uh, it's the basic reason I get out of bed every single morning is to make myself and other coaches be the best they can be, and also the players players that I'm fortunate enough to still be coaching after all these years to assist them in one way, shape, or form to achieve the goals and dreams that they've had that I probably never got to achieve because of injuries and, well, let's be frank, lack of skill. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. I like that. And how do you gauge that? How do you go about gauging that? It's a difficult one. I mean, I think you see players develop, and it's not like friends of mine who are builders or, or carpenters. They've got something constructed at the end of a day yes. and they can, yes. they can see results. So it's it's often not a consequence of a day's work or a week's work. It's, it's months into years. And if you're fortunate enough to spend time in one organization to develop those relationships and uh, to see players move from entry level into professional and then becoming an international player, for example. I mean, yep. I had yep. one player who was 19 years old at the time when I first moved to Christchurch and uh, I had 
was given a house across the road from the training facility to live in and it had three bedrooms and they asked if one of the young players could come in and I could act as a bit of a father figure for him and he was young, inexperienced and didn't know how to train properly, had an unbelievable natural talent but we used to train fairly diligently together and chat every day at home and all that and he eventually became an All Black. So uh, aspects such as that. We used to say when I was with the All Blacks that better people make better All Blacks. So I think it's it's not just on the field, it's off the field as well and how coaches can influence behaviours across the spectrum of activities in society, I think. Yeah, I love it. Man. I love it. So one thing that I really liked after reviewing your work is what you call your quadrant system. So could you maybe break that down a little bit for us? Sure. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think when we all start in strength and conditioning, we basically spend probably 95% of our reading time in strength and conditioning, programming, all the little little nuts and bolts. And as you go further and further into your career, you probably spend less and less time reading all those programming nuts and bolts ideas. And you spend more time looking at leadership. And I spent a lot of time reading business journals and things like that. And the Quadrant Management System came out of the an article that was published in the Harvard Business Review, probably about 10 years ago, I think. And it was looking at a quadrant system that they looked at and said, in quadrant one, there's basically no discussion. It's basically a dictatorship. I decide everything as the coach. Quadrant two, there's um, there's discussion, but I still decide. So I get your input, your ideas, but I'm I'm still the decision maker in that particular scenario. In quadrant three, there's further discussion, and then basically we decide together. We we come to an arrangement saying, well, what works best for you? And then in quadrant four, I step back in this complete player autonomy in a lot of aspects of the training program. So I'm available for discussion and to, to float ideas, but it's more a mentoring role and the player decides elements of the of the training program within the physical performance side of the business. But it's it's more that development of what I guess Brett Bartholomew has pushed so hard over the last few years about, about buy-in. Mm-hmm. And a great friend of mine and, and colleague, uh, Damien Marsh, who works with the Queensland Reds rugby team, he once said, and I'll quote him directly, that it's all about the buy-in you get from the players that you have in the environment that you help create. I like that. And I think, I like and that really, for me, epitomizes the role of um, performance staff, strength and conditioning coaches, call them what you want. But it's, it's all about getting that buy-in, and that comes from trust. And it's all about that development of trust and, and you, being, you being human and being able to put yourself out there, being vulnerable, which I think is a, a an area that probably strength and conditioning coaches haven't done very well. We we tend to be want to push that big macho image of the probably the last generations. But it's all about showing that you have a degree of vulnerability and having that trust relationship with the playing group. And it works both ways. Obviously, you have to trust them to make good decisions within the quadrant management system, but you have to also show them the trust to actually say right. It's up to you now. Where do you want to take this? Where do you need to be? And I think the whole quadrant system is based around conversations that I have, and this is more an in-season than an off-season or pre-season aspect, and saying, well, who is the best player in your position in world rugby? And to this day, I've never had any player I've I've used this with say, oh, yeah, that's me, coach. (laughs) They've they've all had that, that humility, to say, well, it's someone else. So, which that's what I love about rugby as well. So, then my next question is, well, why is that person the best? And then they'll talk about possibly skills and and maybe it's got a really great aerobic system, blah blah blah, all those elements of biomedical qualities that you can talk about. Saying, well, what do you need to do? What are your work ons to move towards that player, to approach that level that you say is the best in world rugby? And then finally, how do we schedule your training week to be more specific to your needs to achieve that goal? In effect, we're trying to prioritize the list of training variables that we can work with so that we can individualize the training process. Then we can actually optimize the performance come game day. And they're all fairly well intrinsically linked. That's that's very cool. Okay, so 
Now maybe I'm confused, but I want to make sure I'm clear on this. So when Alex yeah. Calder came on the show, he talked about this idea of degrees of freedom, right? So is that different? And again, most people think degrees of freedom. They think joint, uh, you know, degrees of freedom. But I know you have a different kind of connotation to that. So is that tied into this quadrant system or are they two different things? Fairly heavily, heavily tied in together. Okay. The degrees of freedom more or less ref refers more to the weight room program. Okay. So still with a, a quadrant management system, but specific to the weight room. Okay. Uh, and the degrees of freedom I, I stole from statistics. So I, I looked at, and I, I did maths as one of my teaching subjects when I was being a teacher. So I've always had a love of mathematics and physics. So anything I can utilize that within, within those areas into, into the performance area is a bit geeky, I know, but it's, <laughs> I enjoy it. It's, and I'm going to quote directly here because I, I'll get lost and the statisticians, mathematicians in the world will, will hang me out to dry on this. But degrees of freedom refer to the number of independent ways in which a dynamic system can move. Okay. And after I read that, I thought, well, isn't that what we do as, as trainers? We basically are working within a dynamic system and we have various constraints that we can move around and, and alter which become degrees of freedom. So as far as the weight room is concerned, those degrees of freedom is in quadrant one, you have no degrees of freedom. And it's basically the training age and experience dictates the number of degrees of freedom gotcha. that you're allowed in the weight room program. So if you come in from an, from an academy program or you're a young rugby player, I do all the programming. Short period of time, you may have shown, again, this trust thing coming through, and it's all about the education with massive education focus in all of my training programs, teaching the players various exercises, various sets and rep protocols, various days of the week and all that sort of thing. So the next uh, quadrant would be you allowed quadrant two, you're allowed one degree of freedom, which is exercise selection. So we have your exercise selection chart. And again, it's, it's up to the individual coach to develop this the way they have developed over time. So it could be a hinge category, a squat category, an up body push category, up body pull category, basic sort of categories across the board. And then the third quadrant, you actually get two degrees of freedom, which is exercise selection still, and also the training days that you need to do to develop aspects of strength, speed, power, and elements such as that. So it could be we start off with a traditional three-day-a-week full-body program. Some people might think that they prefer a four-day upper body, lower body split or some form of split programming. Some might like to try a five-day-a-week program. We have different programs available. And again, we're, we're continually teaching those elements to the players. And the final degree of freedom, so three degrees of freedom in quadrant four, is you get to, to pick the sets and reps. Wow. But you've been exposed to a lot of these things over the, over the uh, time you're with me. So we might do clusters one, one block, we might do wave loading one block, we might do straight sets, we might do an undulating periodization program. And the players are all exposed to these elements. So again, which we're asking a lot of the playing group as well because we're trying to get them to say, well, what gave you the best gains? Right. What did you like to do? And again, it's all about the fun of training, the enjoyment of training is if you like something, you're going to do it harder and longer aren't you right so it, it's like going to a golf driving range and and seeing some guy get up with the driver and and every single uh drive is 300 yards straight down the middle then he goes out and he three putts four greens out of five and he <laughs> he can't pitch inside 50 yards because he just doesn't like practicing that right so and as gary player said using the golf, the golf analogy one step further the harder i practice the luckier i get Yep. So by learning all these different programs, things like this, then we're asking the players to make some decisions. But it's interesting. Over the years, I've been using this, and I've been using it probably in one way, shape, or form over the last probably 10 years. When a player gets to where I consider them to be a quadrant four, so they're, they're fully engaged in the full decision-making process, they often come back to me and say, I trust you. What do you need me to do? So they come full circle and come back to quadrant one where they want me to be 
the decision maker, the driver, the program designer, everything, and they just go out and do it. Right. So like it's it's a nice circuitous uh, situation to be in. I love that. And how long do you think, just on average, how long do you think it generally takes for somebody to get to that quadrant four, that three degrees of freedom? I think probably if they've got a good academy background, so they know their exercise selection, they know what, what works, I would say probably two to three years. Okay. And unfortunately, in the world of professional sport, as much as we are process-driven, we're outcome-judged. Yeah. So, um, and hopefully you're there after three years in the environment to see it come to fruition. Yep. And there's only been a, there's only been basically one program I've been involved that with as, that I've been around long enough to see this develop over time. So, yeah. it works with with the programs I've been putting together. But again, I'm I'm not going to hold it up there as something that's going to work in in other sports and other programs as well. For sure. For sure. Okay. So one thing I did want to dive in on too, because I, I like to learn how other people think. So one thing that I found really interesting is how you break exercises down into different categories like neural, mechanical, metabolic. Could you describe how you kind of delineate or differentiate between those three? Sure thing. I think, again, this is just my take on the, or take on the situation. For me, neural is all about speed power. So any exercise that is more towards the, the velocity end of the force velocity curve is where I'll, I'll group those as neural uh, movements, whether they be bilateral or unilateral. That's another twink in the system to actually work through. Sure. If it's more strength and size, so it's more um, a mechanical property, a more of a, a muscle involvement, less of the neural system, more of the I know neural drive strength and, and they can't be uh, disassociated, but it's more a mechanical uh, movement type activity. So it's more a slower strength towards more towards the force end of the force velocity curve would be more in a mechanical category. And then metabolic is anything that stimulates heart rate response, a massive increase in epoch, say, through doing circuits in the weight room, looking at combinations of anaerobic, aerobic work with those circuits. Uh, I do a beastly circuit that I've done for many, many years now where the player does six exercises, six reps on each exercise, six sets, and those those primary exercises are deadlift, hang clean, front squat, push press, bent over row, RDL. So six in a row. That's a monster. So That's a monster circuit right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hence the beast because it's 666, the number of the beast. Yes. And... Then you do a cardio block at the end of each one of those circuits. So if you've got access to a watt bike, it might be 750 meters as hard as you can on the watt bike and then straight back into the circuit again. If it's a rowing machine, it could be 500 meters on the rowing machine. If it's a ski erg, it could be 250, 300 meters on the ski erg type, those sort of activities. So they fall more into the metabolic type activity. So I've got a, a list of probably 20 odd circuits that are my go-tos as far as circuits are concerned. And players will rotate that. So in this preseason, I'm actually going to expose the players to each of those three different types of training in the training week. So again, all part of the education process, I really want to get the players' cardiovascular, anaerobic, aerobic system development prioritized because they're already quite strong. They've, they've had previous American football-based uh, strength coaches that have really emphasized the speed and, speed and power elements. But I think I need to spend a lot more time on the uh, aerobic and metabolic systems. So everyone will be doing circuits. Everyone will be doing some neural work. Everyone will be doing some mechanical work. But it also allows then for when we move into the season proper for us to have these conversations about uh, the quadrant management system and saying, well, how did the neural type training work for you? Where do you think that would fit for you in the course of our training week? So it's all about those elements to how we put them around within the actual training week itself. No, I, I love that. And it makes so much more sense now when you kind of break it down like that, because then you can have those discussions of, OK, who's the best player in the world? Where are you at? If you were trying to get to that level yourself, which you probably are. What do you need to what holes do you need to plug? How do you get yourself to that next level? And then it makes those conversations way easier for you, I would imagine. A hundred percent. It's Again, I consider myself an educator first and a coach second. Yep. But since coaching is an extension of teaching, they're one and the same. Yep. Yeah, and absolutely. 
the more you can educate your playing group, again, going back to Brett Bartholomew, the greater the, the compliance to the program you have, the greater the buy-in you get. And it could be those light bulb moments because I, I had a player once who was uh, uh, an all-black as well, and he, in our club team, he just hated the weight room. Hmm. I mean, you've all we've all come across people who just cannot stand to be in the weight room, hate, hate the idea of lifting weights. And I just finished reading Convict Conditioning. Hmm. I just said, okay, let's do some body weight movements. And he just loved it. And he would basically just come in with the rest of the group. We'd put him on the body weight program. He'd get through his body weight program in about half an hour. Then he'd do some cardio work on, the, on one of our uh, machines, and he'd be good to go. But we never lost out any of that with the team connection because no one, no one of the team said, oh, no, he's skipping his weights again or something like that. He was there doing what he needed to do yep. to yep. help himself and the team win on Saturday. Yep. I love and that's it. the important factor. I love it. I love it. So one thing that you've kind of mentioned a couple of times now is like the training calendar. And and one thing that I'm fascinated by coming from at least a, a fairly strong background in the sport of soccer is weekly layout in season and how different coaches lay out the training week. So would you give us some insight as to how you lay out your weekly calendar to make sure that your athletes are ready to go on game day? For sure. I mean, rugby is a very traditional sport. And there's and many, many teams I've been involved with is you ask the question, well, why do you have this, this particular week plan? And it's, it's, you get that horrible answer you never want to hear. We've always done it this way. Recently, probably over the last, or oh, I'd say four to five years with coaches such as Eddie Jones, who is now with the uh, English national team, Jose Mourinho from football, looking at the tactical periodization approach to the week planning and things like that. They've filtered more and more into rugby and I've been using, particularly this year gone with the Houston Sabercats rugby team that I work with now, having the Thursday as our, as our rostered players day off. Mm. But I don't really like to do days of the week because in professional sport, there's no such things as Mondays or Tuesdays. There's only game days and game day pluses and game day minuses. Right. So let's assume that game day is Saturday for the sake of putting a calendar day on it. Yep. But if our game is on Saturday, that's game day. So game day minus day before the game would be what we call a captain's run in, in rugby. So, so it'll be a fairly intense, high intensity, sort of sh but short duration. It'll be more or less a dress rehearsal, how we want to play the game. Oftentimes it can be tactical, more so tactical. So it could be a, a runners on walkover rather than a, a full on blast, depending on where you are in the season and how fatigued the playing group is. And But we still do some, some speed work in there and talking about primers, uh, we'll do some, like a little combination, little circuit, a med ball, plyometric, and a sprint. Anything that stimulates the uh, the nervous system. Again, how real that is to some degree. Obviously, there's potential uh, post activation potentiation activities within that. So higher intensity strength work can be utilized on the same day. But again, very very low volume, high intensity work. I know some people who prefer to do a couple of say sets of three on the clean light and fast. Some guys like to go a little bit heavier. Again, that's that individualization of the, the primer example. Then the, then the Thursday, game day minus two is off. And then we tend to front load the week. So game day plus one, which would be a Sunday in our example here, will be just a day off their own recovery. Players get away from the environment. So it's a football free day, rugby free day. Wow. And wow. It's, a, it's a relaxation, mental, reconnecting with family, friends, doing say, normal activities that we encourage to aid the recovery, not from just a physical but from a psychological perspective as well. They might do some form of yoga. They might go for a walk, play with the kids, whatever. But it's a, it's a rugby-free day. Game day plus two is more of a flush for us. It's actually getting out and playing some conditioning games. Uh, it's an opportunity for the guys who didn't get game time the weekend to, to have a little bit more of a, a metabolic hit. So there could be some circuits in there. Could be some extra running involved with that as well. There's reviews. There's practices of specific skills that we need to work on. Tuesday and Wednesday are our big days. So Tuesday may be a double day. Wednesday could be a single day. But that's where we do most of our work on the game day plus three, game day plus four. And then the day off, captain's run, play. I love that. I love that. And one thing I think is really interesting, too, you know, because I've been around different coaches. I think I was with four four coaches in five years. 
oh, working right. with the Indy 11. Yeah, yeah, we had some turnover. But it's really interesting just philosophically because, you know, we had certain coaches where the recovery day was always the, the day immediately after a game. We had some that wanted the recovery day two days after. But one thing I think is really interesting in your setup was the Thursday being an off day. I've seen that where Wednesday is an off day, but I, I haven't seen it a lot, at least in soccer, where Thursday is an off day. But I kind of like that, you know, kind of getting those two high intensity days before and then, again, kind of giving them a little bit of a day off and then ramping back up going into uh, the match. I really like that idea. We tend to have more of a like a volume focus in the front end of the week. So that Tuesday, yep. Wednesday. Yep. And then the day off as a recovery day. And then we have the intensity day, which is the day before the game. And then we play. Yep. So I've done the Wednesday off. I've done most of the teams I've involved with in the past have been on Wednesday off. Yep. And then it gives you the Thursday, which it tends to be quite a heavy day in some places. Yep. So that's a, to me, I think there's some residual fatigue going into the game. Yes. How you manage that Thursday if you have Wednesday off is really, really important as far as the performance on Saturday is concerned. And I've, I've seen and I've been involved with teams myself that we've We've probably overcooked them on the Thursday and they're still recovering yes. on the Saturday and we end up with a with a poor performance. So the Monday also and that is also a, a more recovery focused because in, in rugby, because of the degree of contact, and obviously you could probably apply this to American football as well, that players are some positional players are also very, very sore on that Monday. Yes. So getting players moving again, uh, it could be an I'll I'll grade looking at some GPS metrics, looking at number of contacts in a game, tackles, game-related activities, number of scrum engagements where the, the front row is the, the highest stress level when they collide into the yeah. scrum, jumping, all those sort of elements. And we'll, we'll give a, a, like a band of different recovery activities on that Monday. Yeah. It could be, could be massage, it could be contrast therapy, it could be cold water immersion, it could be infrared sauna, it could be cryotherapy if you had the luxury of those elements involved as well. It could be some conditioning games where you get to move. We'll often play Gaelic football or or soccer or Australian rules football as a recovery game because it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a kick and giggle type situation. Yeah. Nothing's as funny as watching rugby players trying to kick a, a round ball rather than an oval ball. <laughs> and everyone has a bit of a laugh and, and takes, a ste- takes a steam out of the actual session and, and it's self-paced. Yes. So yeah. they're the guys who play. The guys who didn't play might have a play more an up-tempo conditioning game, such as what we would call an offside touch or something like that. Yeah. And I think that's one of the the more difficult parts of managing a team as well is, like you said, you've got your guys, you got to manage your guys that played a lot of minutes and maybe took a lot of hits. And then your guys that aren't getting minutes, you got to keep them fit. You got to keep them fresh and engaged because you never know when you're going to need them, right? So trying exactly to right. keep them in this, I just I used to describe it as like a band of fitness, and they've got to be in that certain band because if they drop too far below, that's when they can start picking up injuries and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, exactly, because obviously um, players who are spending decreased amount of time as far as intensity activity is concerned, and then you ask them to step up, and you don't have that gradual progression, they're gonna they're gonna blow. I think yep. I think we saw quite a bit of that coming out of COVID-19 lockdown situations. And yep. I'd love to be interested to, to look at the, the sports medical reports of the increased incidence of potential like hamstring injuries and other soft tissue injuries, how different that has been post lockdown periods around the world versus a normal preparation and, and how we're going to deal with that moving forward into the brave new world that we find ourselves in 2021. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one last thing that I wanted to dive in on, and you kind of touched on it briefly, but I love this idea of primer sessions, whether it's on the pitch or in the weight room. So could you give us just a little bit more insight on how you use primer sessions and and kind of what, well, let's do two parts here. What's the purpose of a primer session? And then kind of how do you lay it out to maximize, again, your team's performance the following day on game day? I think the whole concept of that primer session basically goes back to Ben Johnson's days in track where, and I'm not sure if it's an apocryphal story. I'm not sure if it was really, really happened. I mean, uh, Charlie Francis, I think, has put a bit put a bit of doubt on the reality of that where Ben would, would squat 500 pounds somewhere between three and 10 minutes before going out to the, to the track and then would uh, blast people off the track with a start. And I think that's where a lot of the primer mentality came from 
But obviously, there's been some more research since then and, and to do with increased activation of the nervous system and, and how long that actually lasts for. I've read everything from some 12 to 72 hours from various research studies over the years. And so, again, I have different opportunities in, within the training week. And again, whether you're home or away will, will influence that as well. So in one team I worked with on away trips, we would do a body weight primer session about five hours before game time. Mm, okay. So we would do some some uh, hops, some skips, some fast calf raises, some some light, some depth jumps and, and activities like that. But the whole session would, would take no more than 15 minutes. Some programs I've used, I had one player in particular who liked to get into the weight room and do three sets of three at 70 to 80% of max on a power clean, and then he was good to go. Game day minus one, I tend to use more of the weight room activities, but they tend to be more concentric in in focus, so there's no eccentric elements associated with it. Yep. So it's more on the, the speed, strength, ballistic end of the force velocity curve, nothing towards the strength speed into force strength, yeah, yeah. Into the curve, so it doesn't leave any any fatigue and players have often said that they feel again this is more subjective than an objective that they feel an enhancement in their well-being and i mean if that's what they get out of it that's the only thing <laughs> you get out of it and they're going into the game thinking yeah i'm i'm pretty good i'm feeling great it's it's been a winner yep. so some of the more sort of studied players were saying well i actually feel like i can lift more i can i can i can hit harder Again, well, that's that's nervous active, that's nervous neural recruitment. Great, great thing. But if you just feel good, that's great. But I'll just tell you one story, which was happened completely by accident. <laughs> Love it. And I was I was with the All Blacks back in 2005 through 2007, and we had we had one player. Oh, sorry, back in those days, you, had, you suited up 22 players. So the remainder of the squad, the eight players that took it out to 30, they worked with me on game day morning. So. I, we were at one gym and I did a circuit with one player. And since he hadn't have had a lot of game time, we did a full-on circuit for about 30 minutes. And it was a it was what I call a power circuit. It was a, a hang clean, sorry, a block, a block clean, push press, one of those uh, dominator rotational like power kinetic power kinetics uh, yep. machines, uh, a jammer, and a box jump. And the, he did five reps of each. And then a hundred meter row as fast as he could five times. So it was a pretty demanding, demanding circuit. So we get back to the hotel, and one of the players in his position has gone down sick. So he comes onto the bench after having done this. And I've, I've said to the guys, said to the coaching staff, said, "I've just worked this player over pretty hard. I mean, he said, no, no don't, don't worry about it. He's on the bench. We'll only use him if." We absolutely have to. Two minutes into the into the game, the player in his position rolled his ankle quite badly, and <laughs> he was on the field at the at the second minute of the game after having done this circuit. <laughs> and he has scored three tries over the course of the next seventy eight minutes. And it's basically as much as you can win a game single handedly in rugby. He's probably done it. Uh, <laughs> it's very much a team game, but he finished off three tries, and we won the game and won it well. And then for the next three weeks that we were together before we broke up and went our separate ways again, as the, the All Blacks does, he was like, Ash, can we do that circuit again on, on Saturday before the game? Oh, it was, oh, it was fantastic. So again, <laughs> what, what was ever planted in his, his head, uh, it was like, whoa, cause effect. Yes. He thought that the circuit was it. So he wanted to do it and said, no, hang on a minute. Cool your jets, mate. We're just going to pull you back a bit, and I'm sure you'll have no problems come next game day when you're selected. So, But it was one of those freakishly good outcomes for potentially bad situation. Yes, yes. That's awesome, man. Okay, big question time, my friend. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Ashley Jones one piece of advice about training and or life, what would it be? I would say don't take yourself so seriously. That's a it's, good one. It's good. only strength and conditioning. It's not rocket science. You're not curing cancer. It's, it's a game. Have fun. I know it's a business and, and people uh, involved with it's lots of big money business and things like that. But I think you've got to continually reflect on why you got into it in the first place. I mean, for me, for me, rugby was always about playing, playing a game with your mates, having fun and just doing something you enjoy. So I think if I could if I could step back and emphasize to my then self, just have more fun. Yeah. Don't take yourself seriously because 
it's it's it should always be fun. And if it's, if it stops being fun, that day is the day you retire or move away to something else. I believe. I love it. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answers can be as long or short as you like. Okay. Okay. Number one, what's your career highlight so far as a coach? When you were going to ask me this one, and it's probably one that I've been possibly thinking about. So it's not probably lightning. It's, it's probably a uh, <laughs> motion. But originally, I, I, I really thought about seeing the number of players that have come to me as young athletes and have become senior players over the course of years and or having them move to another program and, and being successful. I think that's that's a massive highlight. But I wanted I wanted to to give you another little story that and I think for me is is definitely one of the highlights. In international teams, if you leave the international tour early, you're you have to either sing the national anthem or do something to the team. And this occurred on my my first ever end of end of year Northern Hemisphere tour with the All Blacks in 2005. I used to do double duty. I worked with the Crusaders during the first part of the year and the All Blacks during the second half of the year for um, a number of years. And this particular time, you when you leave the All Black tour, you have to do the haka. Oh yeah. So the New Zealand haka, the players do it before a game, and it is such incredible sense of honor and respect for those who've gone before that you need to do it 100%. You can't do the haka half-assed. Mm-hmm. So there was about four people leaving the tour this particular year, and we were based in London at the Kensington Gardens Hotel. And the group decided that I would lead the haka, which is a, another huge honor to be able to do the haka. So I was practicing it, remembering the words, channeling the people I've seen do the haka over the years in, into the situation. And the then all-black captain, Tana Umanga, was standing right at the front of the entire all-blacks collected. And I had to step to the front of the challenge group, which is a haka group, and basically go through the haka and do the haka to the best of my ability. And and now I'm telling the story. I've got goosebumps and the hair starting to rise on the back yeah. of my neck. And that Tana is just staring at me. And if, if the listeners who don't know Tana Umanga, there's a wonderful video clip of Tana leading the haka in Dunedin, New Zealand, a number of years ago. So if you Google up Tana Umanga and, and haka, or the best hakas ever, he's probably led it. So I've done the haka, everything's went well, and and then Tana's just looked at me unstare, un, unsmiling, just staring the entire time. And I finished and just oh, almost collapsed through exhaustion after <laughs> doing it. And he's come up, put his arm around me, he said, you did good, and went, phew. <laughs> and one of the one of the defining moments of my life. Yeah. And then being involved in that and uh, was just amazing. It, it was uh, every time I hear the harker, I always come back to that uh, that story. I love that. So that was pretty special. That's awesome. Okay, number two, what advice would you give to a young coach who's trying to get their start in the industry? Well, I, I hark back to to when I started. There was strength and conditioning was in its infancy. I mean, uh, Boyd Epley had only started it probably for three years before I discovered that it was an actual potential job out uh, avenue for me, and then probably another thirteen years before I actually got my start. But I, I was working in, in Samoa in 2018 and Simon Price, who was a, a really great strength and conditioning coach, and he and I were working together and we decided to to advertise for two interns. And this question really relates back to that in that we must have received 125 applications for these two internships, unpaid internships. You had to pay your way most of the way there. So it was no glamorous type uh, position. But what struck me and Simon when we went through them was that it seemed like every single resume was a carbon copy of the one before, just with the name and contact details changed on the top. So he and I were talking about this, and it was like, and this is when the, the advice comes in, what is your point of difference? I think you have to find a point of difference, and this is hard. It's not going to be an easy thing to solve straight away. It's like... Everyone seems to have an FMS level one. Everyone's done a uh, body composition level one. Everyone's done a, a this level one. I don't often see like a special strengths conjugate from Westside Barbell on many people's resumes. So for some, for some that could be a point of difference. 
Well, I think it's trying to find, A, ascertain what your why is, two, make sure you train and you get so many resumes and read people that they don't even train yep. and they want to become yep. a strength and conditioning coach. So I think that's that's a huge one. And I really like that someone's competed in a weight related activity or sport mm. so they can actually see what they've other what they're programming and what they go through. I really like that when I see resumes. Yep. But also ascertain what your point of difference is going to be. Why why would someone after going through 125 resumes suddenly go, "Oh yeah, Mike Robertson's look good. <laughs> this is great. Yep. He's got oh, he oh, geez, that's the first time I've seen that one." That I think is the biggest thing. It's it. it's probably the hardest thing. Yes. But I think it's it's a necessity if you're going to get noticed, otherwise, it's like everyone's the same. Yep. Yep. Okay. Number three, and I'm going to go off script here a little bit. So one of my current clients is a former, well, I don't want to say former because he's not done yet, but he's an American football player and he's converting to rugby. He's, oh, wow. actu- he's actually going to play in Denver. Pretty big guy too. He was two, well, he was like 305 before. Now he's down to like 271. So for somebody that plays American football, that wants to convert to rugby, what advice would you give them? Get aerobically fit. Yeah. Yes. Uh, depending on the position you played, obviously, is going to be a biggie. I think running backs, receivers, linebackers, safeties are in great positions to transition across. Linemen, lesser positions, because obviously they they live in a, a three-meter square box most of the time and aerobically would find it difficult. Although, when I worked for the Parramatta Rugby League Club back in Sydney, back in the mid-90s, we, had, we recruited a guy called, uh, you may remember, Nate Turner, mm-hmm. who played for Buffalo Bills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he he was one of the first American football players to actually come to, to the rugby league environment. Probably easier a transition because rugby league is, back in those days, was more speed and power similar to American football. Mm. And he worked really diligently and got himself aerobically fit. And, and he would have made our, our roster if he had not been called back by his agent to to go back to a, a team in in the NFL, and he ended up winning a Super Bowl ring as well. So uh, he had a great success in that. But I think is watch as many games of rugby as you possibly can, and if you can watch them from end on. Okay. Actually, see the movement. I mean, it really amazes me when people say, "Oh, I've got fantastic tickets. They're on the fifty yard line on the side." It's like, what can you see from the fifty yard line on the side of the field? Right. I mean, you you're your window of, of vision has come down to about 10 metres either side of that 50-yard line. Yep. But if you're at the back of the field, and I remember got the opportunity to watch the, the USA Eagles play the All Blacks at Soldiers Field a number of years ago, and where it was a last-minute decision, so we had to buy tickets, and the only tickets that were available were end-on. And I was it was great. We sat up there, my wife and I sat up there watching the game and surrounded by – Americans that hadn't had much of an idea about the game, and we end up sort of commentating and saying, "Right, okay, look at this, ball. just look at the drift of this person here, and and look at the hole that's opened up in the middle there." So I would say as much as possible, but you really have to play it. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things we've. I've always loved the concept in American uh, NCAA about redshirting players. Yep. And obviously, redshirting and spending a period of time with the strength and conditioning coach to allow them to get to to bigger and bigger, stronger, faster type deal, but it's one of those games that rugby is one of those games that you you basically learn by doing, okay. making mistakes, getting in, and and learning the skills. The skills of the game are the essential elements of obviously most games. But as watching as many games as possible to actually, particularly with your your position, and if you can watch your isolated position. Yes. What does what does he or she do on the field? What are your movement patterns? And then again, okay. You're, you're an American football player. Your movement patterns are going to be uh, one thing. They're probably going to be fantastic to begin with. So we're not going to do a hell of a lot of work with that, but we are going to have to increase your metabolic fitness. So for, yep. if he joined my team, he unfortunately, he'd be living in the metabolic group for, for <laughs> a significant period of time. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Last but not least, number four, what's next for Ashley Jones? Well, I'm on my last year at Houston Sabercats coming in. I'm, I'm heading back to the United States on January 17th from Christchurch, where, I'm, where I currently live, to take the reins up of preseason again. I'm hoping that we'll perform well enough for me to get to an extension because I'd love to stay with the Houston Sabercats. Our, our ownership group has been wonderful in, in uh, looking after us and, 
They've just built a, a gym for me and we're outfitting at the moment. So uh, real positive steps as far as our program in Houston is concerned. I have, an, I have a desire to to work in uh, South Africa and also South America. The Curry Cup in South Africa is uh, a really, really solid grassroots competition. And there's also a new professional competition similar to the MLR in uh, South America. Okay. And that'd be that'd be great to to be able to finish my career and, and be able to say that I've coached on six of the seven continents. So I've, I don't think Antarctica is going to have a rugby team in the near future. So <laughs> uh, I'll satisfy myself with six of the seven. I think just trying to help people understand more so that we are in a, a humanistic profession. It's a people-driven, relationship-fueled position to, to hold. It's a position of honour to actually hold this position as a strength and conditioning coach of a team, irrespective of what team and what sport. But I think over the last few years, the influence of sports science and the reliance on metrics has taken people away from the humanistic and pushed them more towards a mechanistic approach. Yep. Um, and I think... People have lost connections, and I'm, I'm not a neo-Luddite. I'm not going to destroy new technology, but it's important. I think it's imperative within our coaching environment for us to, to think human first and the metrics and the, and the mechanistic aspect of our industry second because we still have to interpret that data and then – to, to give it to the players who don't have the sports science background that many of the sports science have. We need to explain it in, in terminology that's going to assist them to become better players. So I think that's another aspect that I really want to push, and I've really been impressed by what Brett Bartholomew has been trying to do over the last wee while. I mean, for me, that's that's where we probably need to go back to. I think we've lost a little bit of that. I yep. mean, uh, my generation of coaches probably is one of the last generations to have come out of a teaching background, teaching profession, to become coaches. So you've got more and more science coming in, and, and I'll put my hand up first way. I'm, I'm, I'm really science deficient. I'm, that's an area of thing that I, I need to improve on, but I have people I can call around the world if I have a problem that I can't solve or I don't understand. I think it's important to put your hand up and say, no, sorry, I don't know that. But I certainly know someone who does know that, and I'll get back to you with an answer to that question. Yeah. So I think that's important, and and that comes back to that probably what you asked earlier about what would if you had the space time continuum change, what I would I advise a young Ashley Jones? It's okay if you don't know. Yes. Yep. But find someone who does. Yep. That's one of my favorite Joe Kin anecdotes. Joe 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 used to say all the time, like, you know, I'm okay with saying I don't know. But he would use that as a way to create buy-in with his athlete. He would tell an athlete, I don't know, but I've got somebody that does. And I'm going to text you or I'm going to call you later with the answer. And he would go and seek out the answer. And then he would connect with the athlete and ex explain, hey, this is what I found out. And so he used that as a way to, to show vulnerability and admit yep. that he didn't know everything. But then also as a way to connect in the sense that, hey, look, I don't know everything. But if I don't know something, I'm going to seek out the answer to make you better. And I, that always stuck with me. And that shows the great integrity of Joe Kent. Yep. In that, and for me, the definition of integrity is if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Yep. Irrespective. Yep. One of the reasons uh, my wife, initially, when I first met Joe Kent, I came came back and was all this, oh, Joe Kent, this, Joe Kent, that. And she said, <laughs> oh, oh, have you got another man crush? Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I really enjoyed chatting to Joe about, uh, those those values coming through. Yep. And I think we we push or well, we don't push, I mean rugby's part of that the culture of of values is extremely important in rugby. Yep. And I mean the organization I've worked with has six pillars of excellence. And I think if, if you worked for this organization, irrespective of how short or how long, you'd know those six pillars of excellence as if they were your mother and father's names. <laughs> because they are they are so ingrained in everything that you do from the minute you walk in the gate to the minute you leave, you're in part of that. And then you take that home with you and then you, you imbue other people with it as well. Yep. Cause it's, it's that creation of a, of a culture of, of success, which is extremely important, but the success comes from the building blocks and doing all those little things. Well, like integrity, doing, doing what you say you're going to do. Yep. Very, very important. Yep. I love it. 
Well, Ashley, you've been amazing to catch up with today, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work that you're doing? Well, well, my my profile is pretty low as far as social media is concerned. But uh, for those who are interested in rugby in general, the uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association has a Facebook special interest group that you can go to to have a look. And there's at present there's 430 odd members that share ideas and and look at programs and all that sort of things, which would be a, a good start for you. And, and I contribute to that particular website. But I've also been involved with uh, EliteFTS.com since 2013 and have been a columnist there for a number of years now. So I publish a a regular column that uh, Sheena Leadham, the editor there at uh, Elite FTS, works her magic every month to to transfer my scratchings into something that's uh, readable. So she does a fantastic job there. But I think um, they're probably the two best places. I mean, there's comment sessions on the end of every article and I can access people's emails if people want to get more information, I'm happy to share anything that I've done over the years as well. I mean, it's it's important to ask, but it's also important to give. I think it's uh, extremely important that I'll, I'll give you anything you ask, because that encourages me to think, right, okay, how can I be better, yep. as the opening of this uh, session was, how can I be better tomorrow if I've just given you a lot of information of what I'm doing now? So, What's my point of difference going to be tomorrow, next week? And yeah. again, it's, it's, it stimulates me to keep thinking about ideas. I love and it. sharing ideas love stimulates it. that process really, really well. I love it. Uh, that's awesome. Well, Ashley, again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Mike. It's been uh, great chatting to you. And uh, hopefully I get to meet you in person when I head back to the United States at some stage. my friend that does it for this week's show with Ashley sincerely hope you enjoyed it he is one of those guys that I didn't know super well going into the show but any guy that Alex Calder recommends I'm going to go out and try and interview and man I could not have been happier I think he's just a very sharp guy reminds me a lot of my boy Joe Ken I know coach Ken got a, a shout out in the show but just that really meticulous detail oriented strength coach And I don't say that in a derogatory way at all. I say that in the most respectful way. Like these dudes are sharp. They're on their P's and Q's. The amount of detail and organization in their programs, if you've ever looked at Coach Ken's work or Coach Ashley's work, man, there's just such great information there. And I love just kind of how they have everything planned out, very organized, very meticulous. So hope you enjoyed the show. Even if you're not a rugby person, I'm not a rugby person per se, but I feel like Episodes like this can absolutely help make you a better coach. So if you enjoyed the episode, got one or two things to ask. Number one, if you're not already a subscriber, please take two seconds out of your day. Do that right now. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play, Amazon, wherever you consume podcasts, subscribe to the show there so you will know each and every week when I drop a new episode. If you're already a subscriber, thank you. Go one step further. Go on iTunes. Give me a rating and a review so we can get the show in front of as many trainers, coaches, and rehab professionals as possible. It's my goal to try and make the biggest impact possible in our industry to try and help more trainers and coaches and rehab professionals get their game to the highest level possible. And when you're surrounded by great people like luckily I've had on this show basically since day one. Man, I feel like you can get better each and every week for free just by listening to the show. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.